All right, welcome back to stats. So today's topic is gonna be conditional probability, um, testing for independence, and tree diagrams. All right, so let's get started. Conditional probability is the probability that one event happens given, put that in all caps because it's such a special word, <laughs> that another event is already known to have happened. All right, and the way we usually say this is we ask for the probability of A given B, which means that what's the probability of A given that B has happened, right? And if we're talking about how that looks using our notation, it's gonna be the probability of A given with a vertical line there, B, All right? So we read this as the probability of A given B. So if you know B has happened, if you know B is true, what's the probability of A? All right, so we're going to look at a couple of questions here just to get used to the notation um, so that we're familiar with what actually it's asking. So this says, what is the probability that a randomly selected student is male given that he has pierced ears? So this is basically saying, what's the probability of being male given that the ears are pierced? All right, now, Two-way tables can make these types of questions really easy to answer, all right? So if I tell you that the ears have been pierced, that means I'm looking at this column right here. So what's the probability of being male? Well, if we're only looking at this column, because this is true, I've already told you that the ears are pierced, then the odds are 19 out of 103. Number two, what is the probability that a randomly selected student is male given that he does not have pierced ears? All right, so what's the probability of being male given that the ears are not pierced? So we could either write that as something like P not. All right, that would mean the opposite of having pierced ears. Um, or we could just write it like something like, or what's the probability of being male given no piercings? So we just put it like NP like that. Either way, something to convey that you're talking about no pierced ears. And again, that would move us over here, right? Because we're telling you that this is true. So we're limiting ourselves to this column. And then that would give us 71 over 75. All right, there's 71 males, there's 75 people in total that don't have pierced ears, so that's where that's coming from. What is the probability that a randomly selected student has pierced ears given that she is female? So that's flipping it around, and now we're saying, what's the probability of having pierced ears given that someone is female? All right, so now we're in this section right here. We're saying, okay, the person is female what are the odds that she has pierced ears? And again, in this case, it would be the 84 over just the 88. Now, let's look at this next one here. What is the probability that a randomly selected female student has pierced ears? Now, think about that for a second. And are you saying to yourself, well, that's exactly what we just did? Yeah, all right. It's just 
showing you that the language can be sometimes a little different. So they're telling you it's a randomly selected female student. So this is your given. This is the part that you know is true. You know it's a female student. So we already did this. The probability of having peers to ears given that you're female is the same 84 out of 88 it was the first time. All right, and then this last one here is just saying, this is kind of reading the symbols and saying, all right, this is the probability of having pierced ears given that you're male. So if I'm leaving my, or I'm limiting myself to just the males, the probability of having pierced ears would just be the 19 out of the 90. All right, and again, this is the probability of pierced ears, given that you're male, or given that it's a male. All right, so notice the connection between conditional probability and conditional distributions. You know, we're still limiting ourselves to like a single row or a single column. Um, but now when we're doing a conditional probability, we're really just kind of looking at one of the boxes, um, whereas the distribution, we would give all of them. So when it says, what is the conditional distribution of gender for students who have their ears pierced, right? We're limiting ourselves to the ears pierced part of the table, but because it's a distribution, we're putting down both of them. So we're saying, okay, for males, it's 19 out of 103. And for females, it's 84 out of 103. So this is our conditional distribution of gender, all right? We're saying percent male, percent female for those that have their ears pierced, all right? So very similar to conditional distributions, but we are gonna be able to do some different things with this um, and we're gonna use it in different ways beyond just making distributions. So along with this idea of conditional probability comes this concept of independence. All right, so what does it mean to be independent? Two events, A and B, are independent if the occurrence of one event has no effect on the chance that the other event will happen. Right, and we have a test. We have a way of figuring out whether two events are independent. And our test is that A and B are independent. What am I doing here? Independent when, and this is where the conditional probabilities come in, the probability of A given B is the same as the probability of A. And similarly, the probability of B given A is the same as just the probability of B. So we're saying, regardless of whether you know if B is true or not, the probability of A is consistent. It doesn't change. Once I tell you that B is true, it does not change your concept of A. All right, same thing here. Your probability of B doesn't change just because you suddenly know A is true. All right, so you could say, you know, what's the probability that it's going to snow tomorrow? All right, 
and you might have a you might have an estimate in your hand in your in your in your mind and then i say all right but consider the fact that it's going to be 90 degrees in egypt tomorrow with the probability you think it's going to snow now all right now there might be some connection there i don't actually know but chances are you knowing the temperature in Egypt isn't going to have a big change on your opinion or the likelihood of it snowing in upstate New York. So we could say those two events are independent. Now, to be fair, I don't know the seasonal temperature variations in Egypt. So maybe when it's 90 degrees in Egypt, that gives you some insight into what month it is in New York. And that could in fact impact your probability estimates. But again, let's not read too much into it. Basically, if the one piece of information I provide doesn't change your mind or change your probability one way or another, those two events are likely independent. And we're going to kind of run through calculations to actually test for it. But that's sort of the, the concept of, okay, knowing this one thing doesn't really change your opinion or your estimate of this other thing. All right? That's what it means when two things are independent. All right, so write a sentence explaining the statistical reasoning behind how we know pierced ears and gender are not independent events. All right, so we could say, what's the probability of, actually, let's not even go down, let's not even go down the, the calculation route yet. Let's just think about this. All right, if I'm asking you, what are the odds somebody has their pierced their ears pierced? Right? You might have some estimate. And then if I say, all right, what if I tell you this person's a male? Does that change your estimate? What if I tell you this person's a female? Does that change your estimate? Right? If it changes your estimate, then the events are not independent. So without even getting into calculations here, we can say you are more likely to have pierced ears if you are a female. All right, so that implies that the two things are not independent because as soon as you know one it affects the likelihood of the other so how would we actually show that mathematically all right well we could say what's the probability of having pierced ears all right. well if we look at our table here in total there are 103 people that have their ears pierced and there are 178 people in our sample all right. Now we could say, all right, well, what's the probability of having your ears pierced given that you're female? All right. So now that I'm telling you that we're female, now we're shifting over to this and that becomes 84 over 88. Now, our question that we're concerned with is, are they equal? Right, that's the question. Are those two values equal? If the answer is yes, then it's independent. If the answer is no, then it's not independent. All right. And in this one, it should be pretty clear to see that 103 over 178 is not going to give you the same decimal as 84 over 88. If you need me to prove it to you, 103 divided by 178 is like 58%. 84 divided by 88 is like 95%. All right, so are they equal? In this case, no. So these, again, we're just proving are not independent. All right, so that's sort of the intuition and that's the calculation that supports the intuition.
All right, so let's look at another one here. Lefties in Australia. Is there a relationship between gender and handedness? To find out, we use an SRS of 50 Australian high school students who completed a survey. Based on the information provided, are the events male and left-handed independent? Justify your answers with a sentence. All right. So what that's saying is we're seeing if these two events are independent. We have two ways we can do this. We could start by saying, all right, what's the probability of being male? And then what's the probability of being male given that you're left-handed? All right. This is one way that we could do it. All right. We could also do it in the other direction. We could say, all right, what's the probability of being left-handed? What's the probability of being left-handed given that you're male? All right. You don't have to do it both ways. All right. You can do it one or the other. So I'm going to put the word or there. Both of them are valid. Um, it's really whichever one you want to do. You don't have to do both. We're just checking to see whether these two events are independent. All right. If one of them tells you that they're independent, the other one's going to tell you that it's independent. If one of you tells, if one of them tells you it's not independent, the other one is going to do the same. All right. So let's go through and see what we get here. So the probability of being male is 23 out of 50. There's 23 males out of 50 people in total. All right, which works out to be about 46% or 0.46. The probability of being male, given that you're left-handed, which is this column right here, is three out of seven. All right. And three divided by seven is, we'll say, 43%. So 0.43. Right. So those are close, but they're not the same. So we would say the events are not independent. Now, if we go and check this one out right here, probability being left-handed, well, that's 7 out of 50 for 14%. Probability being left-handed given that you're male. That brings us over here. All right, that would be three out of 23. And three out of 23 is roughly 13%. So again, they're close, but they're not the same. These are giving us the same conclusion, which is what we'd expect. So we can say the two events are not independent because the probabilities changed. I don't mean like these are different than these. I mean, the 46 is different than the 43. The 14 is different than the 13. Now, you might be saying to yourself like, yeah, but those are really close. Shouldn't we just kind of say that like, you know, close enough? Um, and we are going to later on in the course talk about close enough. Um, we're going to be using something called the chi-square distribution. But for right now, we're not going to deal with close enough. Either they're going to be the same, and we're going to say they're independent, or we're going to say that they're not the same, so they're not independent. All right, we're not going to make the judgment call right now of what's close enough. Um, we're going to do that. We'll deal with that later in the course when we look at the chi-squared distribution. We have a way of testing to see what's close enough, um, because it turns out our intuition of what's close enough doesn't always match up with reality. So we're not going to we're not going to make a gut call. We're going to let's we're going to be a little more exact, not exact, but a little more sophisticated about it later on in the course. So right now it's either they're the same or they're not the same and we're just gonna leave it at that. All right, so let's look at another example here. 28 students in a stats class completed a brief survey. The two-way table summarizes the class data. Are the events female and right-handed independent? 
justify your answer with a sentence. So again, female and right-handed, we've got two options. We can do probability of female and then the probability of female given right-handed, or we can do the probability of right-handed and the probability of right-handed given that you're female. Right. Either way is fine. So probability of female, all right? This table doesn't have totals, so I'm just gonna write them in quick. 21, seven, 24, four, 28. All right, so probability of being female would be 21 over 28, which is reduces to three fourths and three fourths is 75%. Probability of being female, given that you're right-handed, now we're limiting ourselves to just this row right here, 18 out of 24, also reduces to three fourths, which means it's again gonna be 0.75. All right, so here, we're seeing that they stay exactly the same. So that would tell us that they are independent. Now, if we were to go down here, we should get the same answer. Let's see if we do. Probability being right-handed. Well, there are 24 right-handed people out of 28 in total. So 24 out of 28 reduces to 6 sevenths. And six divided by seven is, let's just say 86%. All right, probability of being right-handed given that you're female, now we're limiting ourselves to just this column. So that would be 18 out of 21, which again is gonna reduce to six sevenths, which means we're gonna get the same decimal of 0.86. All right, so in this case, yes, they are independent. Because the probabilities did not change. All right, so this is how we can take this information and test to see whether things are independent, all right? And that's a question that will pop up, all right? You'll get a table full of data, you'll be given two variables, you'll be asked to determine whether or not they're independent, all right? And this is sort of the process we go through um, to understand whether or not they're independent, because independence affects a lot of the things that we can do down the road. So it's important to establish whether two variables are independent from one another um, because it's gonna impact calculations and, and tests and stuff that we do um, as we proceed, all right? So let's move on to our third topic for the day. So we did conditional probabilities, we did independence. Now we're gonna look at tree diagrams, all right? So you've made these before. Um, we're going to use them at a little higher level this year, but they sh this core concept should be pretty familiar. All right, so we have a simple example here of flipping two coins. So when you flip two coins, there's a few different options you can get. You could get tails, tails. You could get tails, heads. You could get heads, tails. Or you could get heads, heads. All right. If we wanted to represent that as a tree diagram, all right, here's how we would do that. All right, the first node would represent the first flip. All right, so we've got this first flip and it can either be a heads or it can be a tails, all right? And the chance that it's gonna end up as a head is one half. The chance that it's gonna end up as a tail is also one half. All right. Now, if my first head was a flip, I'm sorry, if my first head was a flip, if my first flip was a head, and then I take my second flip, all right, so this second one represents my second flip, 
I could again get ahead or I could get a tail. All right. Same thing down here. When I take my second flip, I could get ahead, which has a 50-50 shot of chance of happening, or I could get a tail, which also has a 50-50 chance of happening. All right, so this is, again, this is a really basic one. Um, but we can now see what are the odds of each scenario by going along the branches and multiplying the various probabilities. So the odds of ending up here, which is the head-head scenario, is one-half times one-half or one-fourth. Now, again, this is a dull one because everything's exactly the same, but when they get more involved, you've got different probabilities spread throughout the tree and you're tracing the different paths to sort of figure out um, the likelihood of various scenarios. So this one represents our head tail situation. And again, all of these are gonna be exactly the same because all the probabilities are the same. All right, so again, not very interesting, but it does illustrate sort of the concept of how these are going to work. All right, and this would be our tail tail scenario. And again, it's one half times one half. So one quarter. So in this case, you know, our tree has four different options. It has four different endpoints. They represent the four different outcomes that we could arrive at, basically our sample space. And then we can get the probabilities by multiplying the individual probabilities along those branches. So one half times one half tells us there's a quarter chance here, one half times one half, a quarter, one half, one half, and so on and so forth. All right, so this is the concept. All right, let's look at it in a situation that there's a little more going on. Again, we're gonna keep them simple at the start, um, but these can be expanded into much larger creations. So the table shows the classification of 40 students by gender and whether or not they have allergies. Suppose we choose two students at random, draw a, a tree diagram that shows the sample space for this chance process. All right. So let's say that we want to know well, first of all, when we're making the tree, we have to kind of consider what we're concerned about. So if we look at the questions down below, it says, what is the probability both students have allergies? What is the probability that one student suffers from allergies, but not the other? What is the probability the second student chosen has allergies and the first student does not have allergies? So all of our questions deal with allergies. They don't actually deal with gender. So we're gonna create our chi diagram from the perspective of allergies. So when we draw our first student, they either have allergies or they have no allergies. Okay. And again, we're not dealing with the male-female piece here because none of our questions deal with the male-female piece, so we don't really have to worry about it. Now, what are the odds that somebody has allergies? Well, there's 18 people in total that have allergies. There's 40 people in our sample. So the probability of having allergies would be 18 out of 40, which means the probability of not having allergies would be 22 out of 40. Now, after we pick our first student, our second student could also have allergies, or maybe they have no allergies. And again, same thing could happen down here. That next student we pick could have allergies. The second student we pick could have no allergies. So at first, this looks a lot like the tails heads one before, like, okay, you've got two options and you just keep going out and running through the options. What makes this one different is that the probabilities aren't gonna be consistent, all right? So we started with 18 out of 40 people. Once we've selected someone, there's now one person less 
in our sample. So this one right here is not going to continue to be 18 out of 40. It's now going to be 17 out of 39. All right. We already took someone with allergies, so there's one less allergy. That's why we go from 18 to 17. And we already took one person, so there's only 39 people left to choose from. So both of these are dropping by one. Now over here on the non-allergy side, we still have all 22 people without allergies, but we are still down to 39 people because we already chose one of them. All right, and we could do the same thing down here. All right, when we're going down this branch, again, since our first person didn't have allergies, we still have all 18 people with allergies, but we're down to 39 people in total. On this branch, all right, one of our non-allergy people have already been used up, so now we're down to 21 people without allergies, and we have 39 people in total. All right. So we can see that each of these branches is slightly different now. This branch would be 18 over 40 times 17 over 39. This one would be 18 over 40 times 22 over 39. This one would be 22 over 40 times 18 over 39, and this one would be 22 times 21, and this one's over 40, and this one's over 39. All right. So this gives us our different outcomes, and now we can use this to answer these questions. So it says, what is the probability that both students suffer from allergies? All right, well, that would be taking us down this branch right here which we said is 18 over 40 times 17 over 39. So 18 over 40 times 17 over 39. 18 over 40 times 17 over 39. We'll say 19.6% or 0.196. 0.196, and if you want to rewrite that as 19.6%, that's fine. You can also just leave it like this. What is the probability that one student suffers from allergies, but the other does not? Now notice this question doesn't specify the order, so that would actually apply to both of these right here. All right, Both of those branches have one student with allergies, one student without. So we'd have 18 over 40 times 22 over 39 plus 22 over 40 times 18 over 39. Now, I don't know how much you remember about multiplying fractions, but when you're multiplying fractions, you just multiply the tops and multiply the bottoms. So even though these look different, you're still doing 18 times 22 on top and you're still doing 40 times times 39 on the bottom. So even though the order is different, um, you're not actually going to, both of these are going to give you the same value. So I can do 18 divided by 40 times 22 divided by 39. All right, so there's 18 divided by 40 times 22 divided by 39. Again, this is going to give me the same exact value. So I can also just multiply this by two, all right? Because um, all that's changing here is the order in which you're doing the multiplication. So you're going to get the same answer. You're going to get this again. We add them together or just multiply by two, and you're going to end up with this. So we could call that 50.8. So 0 0.508, which is 50.8%. And then number three, it says, what is the probability that the second student chosen has allergies, given that the first student did not have allergies? All right. So they're telling you that the first student did not have allergies. So they're telling you that we went down this branch. 
All right, so we can ignore all of the rest of this because we know that this happened. So that leaves us right here. And then it just says, what's the probability that the second student chosen has allergies? Well, it's the 18 out of 39. All right, we don't have to multiply because this has been given to us. It's no longer uncertain. It's this happened. All right, so it's not 22 out of 40, it's one. It's 100% that this happened. So all we're left with is the 18 out of 39. And 18 out of 39 is like 46.2%. So 0.462 or 46.2%. Right. So again, still pretty basic because it was just two branches, two branches, but we can see now that these numbers start changing um, and it makes the calculations a little more involved than it was just in our um, coin flipping example. All right. So this multiplication that we've been doing, um, We've sort of just been kind of taking it for granted, like, okay, you multiply these probabilities together. Really, what this is called is the general multiplication rule. And this states that the probability that events A and B both occur. can always be found by the probability of A and B. So that's and, just a reminder. Equals the probability of A times the probability of B given A. All right, so that's what we've been doing here when we go down these branches. All right, this is the probability of A or the probability of allergies. And then given that this happened, these are the probabilities of our second events. And we can just multiply those together. All right, so that's called the general multiplication rule. All right, if you want to know the event, the probability of both events, um, you can do the probability of A times the probability of B given A. And the way the tree diagrams are set up, you know, the branches are conditional because we're doing those probabilities based on the first event happening. All right, so let's take a look at one more example and then we'll call it a day. Draw a tree diagram to represent the situation and then answer the question. All right, 27% of all adult internet users are aged 18 to 29, another 45% are 30 to 49, the remaining 28% are 50 and over. We also know that 70% of internet users 18 to 29 visit YouTube, along with 51% of those 30 to 49, and 26% of those 50 and older. What percent of all adult internet users visit video sharing sites? All right, so we can use a tree diagram to help us answer this question, because we have a lot of like individual probabilities going on here. The tree diagram will help us organize those, and then sort of combine them together to arrive at our final answer. All right, so we're gonna start this time with three branches because we have three age groups. So we're gonna start with the 18 to 29s. We've got the 30 to 49s, and we've got the 50 plus. All right, so we're starting with the ages here. Now, it tells us in the problem that this represents 27%. So I'm going to write that as 0.27. This represents 30 to 49 is 45%. And 50 plus is 28%. Now, from there, we get information on whether or not they use video sharing. All right. So from that point, it can either be a yes, they use it, or a no, 
they don't. And that same choice is for each age group. Either yes, they use it, or no, they don't. Yes, they use it, or no, they don't. All right? And the problem gives us those probabilities. It says 70% of internet users 18 to 29 use it. So we know this one is 70%, which means 30% must not. We go to the next one here. It tells us 51% use it, which must mean that 49% don't. Again, those are just adding up to 100%. Uh, and then on the last group, it tells us that 26% use it, and it, which means that 74% must not. So when it says what percent of all adult internet users visit YouTube or use video sharing, right, really what it wants to know is what's the probability of this branch, what's the probability of this branch, and what's the probability of this branch? Because all three of those branches result in someone using video sharing. All right? These three, one, two, three, are the people that don't use it. So we don't really care about them. So what we do is we say, all right, 18 to 29 year olds make up 27% of internet users, but only 70% of those use video sharing. 30 to 49 is 45% of internet users, but only 51% of them use video sharing. 50 and older is 28% of internet users, but only 26% of them use video sharing. So if we go through these, we've got 0.27 times 0.7. This gives us 0.189. We've got 0.45 times 0.51. This gives us 0.2295, and then we've got 0.28 times 0.26, that gives us 0.0728. So if we add all of these together, all of those combined gives us 0.189 plus 0.2295 plus 0.0728. 0.4913 or 49.13% right. use video sharing. All right. So the tree diagram can be a useful way to sort of organize your information and organize your thoughts so that you can kind of properly apply the percentages and do the calculations you need to answer a variety of questions. All right. So, you know, we'll practice more of these. They'll get longer, they'll get more involved, um, but the, the idea remains the same. You're sort of spreading out the different possibilities, finding the probabilities associated with those possibilities, and then using that to answer, you know, a variety of questions, whatever, whatever they may be. Okay. So hope this was helpful. Obviously you have if you have any questions, just let me know and we'll go from there. All right, great. Have a good day. Bye.